Discord. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to um, pass this, this session off to Kim, who's going to lead us, and I will be going off camera. If you have questions along the way, go ahead and enter them into the chat box, and I will be collecting those questions for our panelists um, at, to ask sort of towards the end of the session. So thank you to our panelists for being here, and I will pass it off to Kim. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm thrilled to be hosting this panel. One of my favorite things about the trust and safety space is that everyone seems to come to it with a hugely diverse background, always very interesting experiences. Um, and I just love to learn about that people that way. Uh, so this should be a fun conversation. We have an amazing group here today to tell us about their career journey from healthcare to trust and safety and kind of what those experiences look like for them. Uh, and so I would love to just do a round robin here to kick it off. Um, some short introductions. Uh, Jasmine, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I'm Jasmine. I work for um, Thumbtacks Trust and Safety. Um, I've been here two years, last week, my two years. Um, I have experience as um, front desk reception, at medical facilities, cardiology clinics specifically. Um, also, I've done um, some work as medical admin services specialist where I approve um, different claims, also approve um, authorizations for surgeries, medical procedures, um, exams, different different courses that way of that. And also um, I worked at Vanderbilt lastly as a um, patient access specialist, scheduling patients um, appointments, also um, insurance approvals there as well. And then lastly, I transferred from um, th t uh, TikTok um, as a content moderator, where I also did some um, trust and safety work. And now I am here and I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Laura, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hey, I'm Laura McLester. Um, <laughs> I started off in social work, our social work as a medical social worker, mostly working at our children's hospital um, in, on the oncology unit, and then transitioned into the world of OSINT, working with a PI, private investigator, and um, then jumped into the world of trust and safety. Uh, I was at LinkedIn for over four years as an investigator and an analyst there and recently started teaching full-time at our university, teaching digital forensics and trust and safety out of the criminal justice department. Very cool, thank you. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Edwards. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade. I'm the wellness and resiliency manager for North America and Columbia task us. Uh, I've been in trust and safety in, in this role for very close to two years. And prior to my current role, I worked in healthcare for nearly 15 years, which is strange given that I'm only 25, <laughs> um, starting with a few years in clinical roles, but then spending the vast majority of my career in administration and operations, specifically in crisis management, disaster response, compliance, and risk management. Awesome. Um, and my name is Kim Corcoran. I am a senior manager of incident operations at thumbtack.com. I work along the lovely Jasmine. I've been with Thumbtack for about two and a half years um, and in the trust and safety space for over six. Uh, and my kind of healthcare background experience is all in operations and admin. Um, I did uh, operations management for outpatient specialty clinics. Um, for a while, because I too am only 25 years old, much like Sarah. Um, and uh, again, transferred into the trust and safety space uh, six years ago. So um, I, I'd like to kick it off uh, with kind of a pretty basic question. Um, how did you get into trust and safety? I'll take that. Um, you know, as with so many things in life, I, I know someone, I knew someone. Uh, I was at a point in my career where I knew I wanted and could do something different, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what that was. 
And what's funny to me about this is that one of the reasons I got into social work and love it so much is that you can do anything, mostly anywhere. The skills and experiences are so valuable that they're diverse and applicable to a lot of fields. Yet, I found myself feeling boxed in, knowing that there was more out there, but I could only see the same opportunities that I had always seen until I saw a we're hiring post by a former colleague. And we hadn't talked in, in ages, um, but we had worked together at an emergency room many, many moons ago and are connected through social media. And um, spoiler alert, it was for the role I'm in now. And I had followed her growth and success for this mysterious company that seemed really cool. And it didn't seem social worky at all. And it was immensely intriguing to me. Um, so I did something I'm really good at, which is I started asking her questions and just, you know, came from a place of curiosity. And that led me to being here today. Amazing. Laura or Jasmine, do you want to share how you even heard about trust and safety or how you ultimately made that transition? Sure, I can go. Um, so yeah, basically I, I knew somebody in the field and they knew that I was trying to get out of um, the admin um, prospect of, of the industry. Um, so they referred me to TikTok and I was like, okay, I've never done this before, but I think I have the skills. I think I'm... Um, I can handle it. So um, that's how I got into it. And I started to love it. Then I started taking a course, um, a cybersecurity course. Um, I got into that. I didn't like it, but I started just doing um, Google searches for jobs and trust and safety can't continuously came up, even though it's not technical, it's still protecting the platform essentially. So I just, you know, applied and ran with it. So that's how I got into it. Fantastic. Um, I was looking to leave social work. I had some scheduling conflicts and kind of hit an administration kind of glass ceiling. And so I had a friend who was in kind of the cybersecurity world, but did a little bit of OSINT type work, introduced me to the world of OSINT, and I fell in love with it. Um, I did some online learning to gain additional skills and kind of learn about the tech investigation aspects of that and then decided to pursue um, a master's in computer forensics. And as part of that, we had um, the LinkedIn trust and safety team come to campus and I met them and I fell in love with what they did and the team was great. And so I um, threw myself somewhat ruthlessly at saying, do you need an intern? I need an internship. And they created um, a slot on their team for the much larger, fabulous internship program at LinkedIn. And I applied and was able to land that. And then that changed, um, that transitioned into a full-time role. Um, and so I think probably learning about OSINT was my first kind of foray into it. And then understanding all the different roles in trust and safety and kind of where my love of asking questions, my curiosity fit well, um, I love data. And so being kind of an investigator and then moving into an Intel analyst role there uh, was a was a good fit there. Awesome. Uh, unlike the three of you, I did not know anyone in trust and safety. I think the, the similarity is that I was in healthcare and felt kind of boxed in. Um, felt like I couldn't really make a change or, you know, move, move the bureaucracy forward, so to speak, um, and was really just getting burnt out. And despite being in Washington, in my area of Washington State, not a lot of tech companies, not a lot of startups, uh, but Rover.com opened their HQ2 uh, here in Spokane. And I was like, I like dogs. I can, I can do admin things with dogs. <laughs> And applied to a role I knew nothing about. It was essentially like a, a fraud squad role. Um, and fortunately, the director at that time picked my resume out and was like, I don't think that this one is for you, but what about, um, you know, incident operations side of trust and safety? So um, took the job not knowing really anything about trust and safety or working in tech. Uh, but figured it out along the way. So, yeah. Um, Jasmine, what do you think was the biggest hurdle or the biggest the, the biggest surprise that you encountered making that transition from 
you know, a pretty structured, some might even say formal industry of healthcare um, into tech and trust and safety? Yeah, so I, I was pretty intimidating um, at first. Also being with um, Thumbtech being an external hire and most people in my class were already established here. So just learning the platform, getting used to um, the functions of everything, how, how this operation works versus what I've been used to. So just getting the, a new routine, um, my confidence, was a little bit lower because I was like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm deer in headlights, essentially. That's what I was thinking, telling myself. But um, just um, navigating help from my teammates, um, that kind of grew that confidence. And then public speaking as well, this forced me to be a little bit more vocal. So um, while I was a little bit uh, insecure uh, in the beginning, it, this has helped me grow in all aspects of my career. So. Mm -hmm. Happy to go next. Yeah, of course. Um, for me, I would say the biggest surprise was just the atmosphere of it all. Like having exclusively worked in a realm that was governed by a multitude of accrediting bodies, rules, regulations, like Joint Commission, CMS, you know, or, or Medicare, uh, your state regulations not having those felt indescribably foreign. Um, and the innovation that's able to take place um, is, is incomparable. And let me be clear, those regulations and accrediting bodies, they exist for a reason, right? We don't want nurses, doctors, therapists to just feel free to innovate how they'll treat their patients that day or how they're gonna use medications, right? They're, they're there for good reason, um, but not having to, take those into account as part of my daily life was was a really bizarre adjustment. I can relate to that so much. <laughs> yeah. Laura, do you have anything you want to add? Any uh, big surprises you encountered? Yeah, I definitely agree with the innovation. I think, um, you know, social work was not exactly the same every day because families were different um, and they all had different needs. But trust and safety, the cases had a wide variety. There's definitely clusters of types, <laughs> but the wide variety is nice. Um, it also will never, I mean, I've seen depths of humanity, but it still will never cease to amaze me how people want to use our platforms at times. And wow, I didn't, I didn't think of doing that interesting, malicious, possibly uh -huh. abusive action. Curious. Um, and I think the other thing was, you know, on my team, I was the only one who had this like computer forensics background. My team was such a melting pot of amazing backgrounds. I mean, we had English majors, we had, you know, former government workers. And so that melting pot experience was different than healthcare because social workers kind of go through the same training. And so having people from all different backgrounds, both educationally degree, not degree, um, different work environments, whether they came from startup or government or something totally different. Um, that was really fun to be around. It was really, it, it's really fun to do casework like that because everyone kind of takes a different approach. We had people on our teams that were more artists in terms of their investigation and more scientists in terms of their approach. Um, so the melting pot aspect um, was really, was really fun. Absolutely. Yeah, the creativity of bad actors never ceases to be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Awesome. And Laura, what would you say was uh, maybe the most challenging part of your transition? Um, I think that there are two things. Um, number one was just learning the tech side, all the jargon, um, so much jargon, um, and just understanding how different data points work together um, in my investigations, you know, we had to understand about IPs and domains. And so really figuring out how those worked, how those leverage, how to explain the logic um, behind that. Um, and the other part that was um, a challenge that I had to kind of come to grips with was knowing what my new role was and where that stopping point was. So for social workers, you know, if we um, find um, somebody going through a hard time and making different self-harm threats, 
we know where to take that to and we know the next step. Well, in trust and safety, we help those people as well, but our ending point looks very different than a clinical social worker. And so understanding, okay, this is my role. This is how I can best help. But here's the stopping point because it's a different stopping point than, than being in the hospital with somebody. And so, you know, understanding that and coming to terms with that was, um, was interesting coming from, from social work. Yeah, kind of that, that gray area that we live in. Yes. Yes. Jasmine or Sarah, any, any uh, thoughts on the most challenging part of that transition? Um, for me, it was, um, I guess, the responsibility aspect and the, the accountability for the incidents that I'm handling and trust and safety. I know when, um, when I was scheduling appointments or whatever, it would be, you know, this is what the doctor says, so this is what I'm going to put down. Um, but now it's kind of my responsibility to look at all the documents that I have, all the information that I have, and make a uh, decision where whether I action an account or or whatever um, the best case for for the case to go. So just, you know, that part would be most challenging. Um. For me, it was probably just going from an expert to feeling like a grasshopper again. Uh, you know, I, I I had been in and had been doing work in in our community for so long, um, and you know the type of work I did, it had I'd have established myself as a as an expert in 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 these certain realms, and then starting from scratch was just so strange because it wasn't a feeling I was used to. I was used to feeling so confident about everything I knew about everything I was doing. There was nothing that could catch me off guard. And then suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, I know nothing. I don't know what any of these acronyms mean. Even if I know what they mean, I don't know how they fit into this puzzle. Um, and so having to kind of start from scratch and, um, relearn um everything including you know rebuilding confidence in a new field i think was was a big challenge um but also a really exciting one because it just reinforces that you can always start over you can always try something new um those uh you know those skills that we have they don't go away they are transferable absolutely um yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I, I say frequently, especially during open enrollment, I feel much more comfortable assessing insurance coverage than, you know, writing a one pager and pitching it to the product team or something still to this day. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, much like I think Jasmine as well, my biggest sort of learning curve or, or challenge was trusting my own decisions because, you don't have CMS or some other governing body sort of telling you that like, these are the very uh, black and white <laughs> guardrails. Uh, this is definitely a yes coverage. This is definitely a no coverage. Um, and if you want to make something happen, you need to make the decision and, and push that ball down the court. So um, yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely like a leap of faith, but um you know, we've talked a lot about the challenges that come with that transition, um, maybe some of the str bigger stressors or insecurities, but I want to kind of talk about now um, what, what each of you did to maybe help support yourself or help others through that transition. Um, how did you manage those insecurities? You know, what, what resources did you leverage? Um, Personally, I think for myself, uh, moving from healthcare into the tech space into trust and safety uh, definitely lit a fire under my uh, imposter syndrome like nothing else has. Um, I knew nothing <laughs> and it was very evident that, um, you know, everyone else had had kind of grown grown with this company and, and had written all of the procedures and workflows and, and grew the team from the ground up, which was amazing. Uh, but I was stepping in completely as an outsider, uh, knowing, knowing nothing. So, uh, one of the ways that I really successfully managed that was just being vulnerable and talking about it. So if even to this day, if anyone is having like a rough day, I will tell them all about my imposter syndrome because 
pulling those thoughts out of your head and saying them um, out into the wild somehow make them have less power. Uh, they make them seem slightly less absurd than, than those thoughts just rattling around in your head. So that has been something that has helped me a lot um, to manage those insecurities is just realizing that, you know, everyone's kind of going through it. And the more you lean on your resources and the more you lean on those around you who genuinely want to help, um, the better off everyone is. So does anyone else want to share about how they maybe manage some of those insecurities? Sure. Um, you actually hit the nail on the head. It's exactly <laughs> what I did too. It, I named it to tame it, right? It takes the power out of those unpleasant emotions. Um, and so, I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't guess the number of times that I chatted with my supervisor and said, I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. I, d I don't know at all. What does this mean? What should, I, you know, what are we even doing? And it was uncomfortable, um, you know, and, and thankfully I have an incredibly, absolutely incredible supervisor who has been so instrumental to this transition, um, you know, naming my own insecurities coupled with a supervisor who has seemingly perfected the art of leading with that vulnerability has, was was and has been a pretty magical combination because it takes so much of the the fear away so much of the you know am I good enough am I doing good enough of a job am I really cutting it in this new world um so yeah leaning on leaning on that support was instrumental yeah yeah, I think I did the same. I had great uh, managers who were very human. Um, and so they welcome like, hey, we're how you're doing. Let's walk through this. Um, the other thing, I probably handle it by over documenting so so that I can retrace my steps. So I'd go out, document whatever case and decision. And then I'd go out and touch grass because it's good to like breathe some fresh air. And then I'd go back and I could go back and look like, does this make logical sense once I've stepped away? And I created some, you know, kind of informal checklists so that each time I was approaching a case, I would kind of remember, oh, did I look under this rock? Did I check this out? And it didn't apply to every case, of course, but as I was kind of getting my feet under me, that way I didn't have to, you know, at the beginning of the case go, okay, where do I start? Like, I, I know where to start now. I've got an informal checklist and that kept being being built and then you know once I got my feet under me more I you know always tried to mentor our new hires because that's also a great way to reinforce is by teaching so whatever you've learned it also kind of helps you check your logical process if you're trying to explain it to somebody you're like oh wait or oh this is why it kind of just kind of builds up that you know what we used to all be an expert on in healthcare it starts kind of rebuilding that 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 portfolio. See one, do one, teach one. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And I would say the same. I, I leaned on my teammates and I still do um, to, this, to this day. And being vulnerable is something that's hard for me, but it forced me <laughs> to be more vulnerable and you become comfortable with it. Because um, if you're feeling like this, somebody else has felt like that or they are feeling like that so um definitely your teammate yeah, one thousand percent um what skills or experiences uh that transferred most seamlessly from healthcare to trust and safety were you most surprised by um i know personally i was just genuinely surprised kind of at face value that that anything i i had gained from uh, my healthcare background transferred well, but um, Laura, let's start with you. I'd love to hear kind of uh, with your clinical background, especially like what? This is probably my favorite question because often people are like, oh, you've been in tech forever. I'm like, no, I was in social work first. And I'm like, you don't see the natural progression and they're kind of stunned. And I'm like, but here's the thing in healthcare, especially in social work where I was in, in the clinical world, you know, I was always triaging people, which an unfancy world for triaging is called investigating people. Slightly creepier when you say it that way, but you're kind of doing that. We would get families coming in facing the worst day of their life. And I would have to say, okay, what resources do you have? Uh, my Children's Hospital treats kids from all around the state. 
So you have every socioeconomic level that you can imagine. So it was saying, what resources do you have? What problems were you facing before this crisis hit? Um, because crises don't, you know, pick families that are stable, families it's that are hard. that are working through things. Exactly. And so, you know, it was really about asking questions, um, deciding what they were telling me and how those dots connect, and also trying to understand what they weren't telling me, reading between those lines and saying, okay. Hey, to connect these dots, I either need to ask a different question or is there a resource that I need to pair them with? Well, a resource is also a fancy name for a tool. So in trust and safety, I was looking at data and saying, what is the data telling me? What is the data not telling me? How do I form a narrative to tell this story? Like if I just throw a bunch of indicators of compromise at somebody, no one cares. Like what is that doing? What is the actor doing? What is the account doing? <laughs> So how do I tell that story? And then what tools do I need to either dig up more data or take an action or, or make a decision? So overall in social work, um, in, my, in my program, I was challenged to ask probing questions. And that's still something I do daily in trust and safety is I ask probing questions. Sometimes it's of a data point, sometimes it's of a profile, or sometimes it's of a larger situation. Take anything in the news, like, okay, this is happening in the news. What is this going to look like if it hits our platform? You know, what is this data that's already here? What is that telling us about, you know, whatever situation is going on? Um, and so just connecting those, connecting those dots. It's still the same thing. It's just not, it's not people in person dots. It's people online dots. Yeah. I would say for me, um, the transferable skills where it be like soft skills, um, attention to detail, building the relationships with the people that you're you're working with or you're trying to help. Um, I feel like being very empathetic, friendly, um, that can make some of the escalate most escalated people calm down. Um, so I feel like that's that's transferable. Sure. Um, I'd say diplomacy, um, you know, leading and working on interdisciplinary teams in, in the healthcare world it was such a lesson in diplomacy. Um, I'm sure for those of us on this call who are or have been in healthcare, the different personalities between nurses and doctors and the therapists and, and you know, the various disciplines that come together they can clash at times. And as a social worker, I often found myself as the mediator of sorts that was like, okay, so so and so is really, you know, invested in doing this. And this is what this other person wants. How can we get together at the table? Um, and, and how do we have these really difficult conversations that we sometimes have to have um, about whatever problem there might be? Um, so I think that diplomacy and being able to have those difficult and at times uncomfortable conversations has been really valuable in this realm too, um, because I'm I'm not afraid to call something out, even if it's uncomfortable, because I know that we have to work through it one way or another, right? If we don't call it out, we'll just have to work through it later and it'll just uh, linger. So that piece was really important. Um, also, I would say the ability to be quick on your feet, um, be decisive, you know, and in, in healthcare, you don't get hours to make a decision or, you know, figure out what the plan might be. And so being able to really quickly and succinctly figure out what, what, what am I presented with? What am I working towards? How am I going to get there? And doing so confidently and, and with the right evidence to back it up. Um, and I would, also echo the emotional intelligence piece, just being able to read people um, and being able to, um, vulnerability has come up several times during this call, is being able to model that vulnerability. Like if we can tell that somebody, something's just not right with someone, we can lead with that vulnerability and say, hey, is everything okay? And just check in. And I think that also leads to, to creating trust within a new system um, with new people that don't know you, that don't know anything about your work history and what you bring to the table. So I think it helps break down barriers um, to, to exercise that emotional intelligence. 
Yeah. Uh, diplomacy is the number one word that I use when people are like, how the heck did you get from there to here? Uh, because I assumed that I would be in, you know, healthcare administration and operations really my whole career. It's what I did immediately out of college. Um, but yeah, no one wakes up in the morning and is like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call my insurance company to figure out why this surgery wasn't, was denied. Uh, just like no one wakes up in the morning and is like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have this, uh, you know, home care project go a little bit sideways and have to contact the tax stress and safety team. So uh, that diplomacy, positive positioning, figuring out how to like read the room really, really quickly. Um, and just like, I, I, I kind of always joke that no one knows diplomacy or uh, being able to communicate effectively in stressful situations until you've had to call a week's worth of a physician's schedule and reschedule every single patient, or you've had to tell a surgeon that their favorite scrub nurse is unavailable and <laughs> can't scrub in on their case tomorrow. Um, or really any bad news to a surgeon, uh, you, you figure out quickly how to, um, you know, position less than favorable news in an okay way, and also be able to quickly provide an alternative solution. Um, Sarah, I wanted to circle back really quickly about what you said about vulnerability and how it sort of applied to your role in healthcare, uh, because I feel like I had a much different uh, I guess, relationship or experience with vulnerability, working so closely with physicians, uh, particularly, I think surgeons have, you know, a, a specific personality type um, that making a mistake or not knowing something or or th that sort of thing was kind of not really okay in a lot of the clinics that I, I worked with. Uh, and I understand why, you know, doctors aren't supposed to tell patients that they messed up. Doctors aren't supposed to tell patients that like they don't know or that they made a mistake. And so I think, you know, innately in our healthcare system that that piece of vulnerability is missing um, from, from the top for a variety of reasons. So that's, that's sort of how I, I guess, was brought up and then struggled again, in that transition to say like, I don't know, because I didn't know anything. Um, so how how do you think that that sort of like applied differently maybe mm -hmm. in your role? Well, I think that it was, you know, it, it's in my previous roles, especially, I, I wore so many hats. I was a compliance um, director, performance improvement director, and um, comp no, compliance officer, risk manager, and performance improvement director all at once. And so I served a lot of different people. And so I, with that also came kind of this, you know, chameleon approach to whom do I approach with what type of, of me, right? So when I was talking to, to the nurses or the social workers from my compliance perspective, um, there had to be a, a certain degree of vulnerability because I learned over time that just being um, kind of more authoritative just doesn't work because people end up feeling suffocated and stifled. And so it was more of an approach to a certain um, realm. Whereas, you know, with the with the doctors, I certainly took a took a different approach, although there were times, you know, when. I did model that. And when I did have those uncomfortable conversations, I was like, hey, Dr. So-and-so, how do you think that felt to the person who was at the other end of that message? And they were, would often be kind of stumped because, you know, there were certainly times where it's like, why are you asking me this question? And I'm like, well, because it's an important question to ask, but they also knew me. And so we had that type of rapport. And so I think in the, in the healthcare realm, it, it was more of a really strategic use of vulnerability mm -hmm. versus in the trust and safety world it is a, a constant that I get to practice a constant thing that I get to apply yeah that that definitely makes sense um so using vulnerability is certainly one way to sort of build that rapport and quickly establish trust um which obviously vital in both healthcare and trust and safety um 
what are other ways that you all uh, work to establish trust quickly, either um, with your healthcare background or now with your users or even, um, you know, business partners or stakeholders? I think um, transparency is very important. Um, being super, super responsive to um, whoever you're dealing with. If, even if you don't have a extravagant update, just letting them know that you're still working with them. You're still trying to find the best resolution. Um, and that you you haven't given up. So I think that's very important in my incident handling. Yeah, there's there's a lot of power in the no update update. Right, exactly. <laughs> and your tone, and your yeah, tone is a big one too. <laughs> yeah, I like no update updates because then I know that I haven't fallen between the cracks. And mm -hmm. I think um, following through, doing what you say you're going to do, even if you hit a wall, trying to figure out how to get around that wall, not just be like, well, I couldn't do that. Like, that's not helpful because someone's going to have to figure it out. So finding a way around the wall, under the wall, over the wall, whatever. Um, and also becoming kind of the go-to spot for problem solving. Even if I don't know the answers, can I help, you know, can I, can I use my love of being a resource person? Can I help them find um, the answer? Because not only do then I get to kind of be that resource person, but I also learn more about, you know, the platform or a casework or whatever myself. So it's kind of twofold. I'm helping, um, but I'm also learning. And, you know, finally being that true like team player and obviously setting like work-life boundaries, but early on, you know, being real quick to pitch into different escalations, even those fun Friday afternoon ones, because not only are you building like, oh, this is a team player, you know, someday they're going to help me. But you're also learning because a lot of the escalations that I pitched into were outside of my, you know, kind of normal casework, you know, maybe of a sister team. And I could lean into that or just somebody else that had kind of a different vertical on my team. And so I kind of got to dabble in different case topics. And that is, you know, one way that I was able to make an internal transfer to another team because I had, you know, been able to step in and help them when they were a little shorthanded. And then I, I had enough background knowledge then to move into that. Um, but it also helped kind of build a reputation of like, you know, I, I'm a team player, you can come to me, um, but also, you know, the other way around when needed. Laura, Laura gets things done. I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, how, how, how do you each approach difficult situations if you know that maybe you're stepping into an escalation or you know that you're stepping into something that, that has gotten really messy and gone sideways? Um, and how has that been influenced by uh, healthcare or, you know, past trust and safety roles? Um, I, I saw a, a picture last night of, of a bison and it, you know, was a bison that was really frozen and icicles all over his fur. And it was talking about how bison head into the storm because they know that's the shortest and quickest way through it. Um, and I would say I approach it like that. Um, head on and lean into it and and again name it to tame it right call it out um because whatever the difficult situation is it's not going to go away by not talking about it by trying to avoid it like it's still there it's still gonna have to get dealt with and so um you know, finding again, using that diplomacy, right? How do I have this conversation? Who's my audience? That's the first question. Who's my audience? What do I know about them? And and kind of what's their style and how do I know them to, to be receiving of information? So then I can use that diplomacy to bring up whatever the topic might be and approach it from, a, a, you know, through a lens of collaboration. Like, I'm not calling this out to call anybody in particular out. I'm calling it out for all of us so that we can then work together to get through it um, and, and normalizing the fact that difficult situations exist. Yeah, absolutely. because the fact that they exist, does it's not a problem, right? The fact that difficult situations exist is 100% normal. It is 100% normal that they're difficult and they're uncomfortable. That's all okay. So we can just own it up front and then work through it neither good, bad, or otherwise, it just is what it is. That's right. 
So yeah, I love what you said about leaning in. That's uh, typically the approach that I take is just head head first um, with as much of a curious mindset, positive intent, and as much empathy as I can muster on that particular day. Um, I'm sure we've all heard it at some point in our lives, either professionally or otherwise, like, and they act like this is the worst thing that's ever happened to them. It's like, yes, but maybe it is. You know, that's that's a pretty dang blessed life if, you know, uh, something something small, but also maybe it's like the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Like, and it's, it's such a good point. It. Yeah, it, it, um, because, you know, it's, I think part of the, part of the recipe to success with difficult situations is going in with a completely open mind, you know, not thinking, okay, John over here, I already know what he's going to say, or I know what this person is going to say, like to really practice not doing that and having that open mind and curiosity that you mentioned so that the table just starts with, with fresh eyes um, and no, and not, no preconceived notions of any sort. Um, I would definitely agree, um, you know, just leaning into that empathy, thinking about if it was your mom or yourself in that position that's hard, you don't know what they just learned about themselves, maybe they have a, you know, diagnosis or something, you don't know how much weight is on them. So just having that in the back of your mind, speaking as if you would want somebody to speak to you and um, just doing it head on. Um, also, it's helpful if you have something visual, visually that they can see maybe a resource or maybe some type of article or your guidelines or whatever, showing that to them, letting them know that, you know, you are trying, but this is, you know, the options that we have. If A, B don't work, maybe C, and that'll be the last resort. So um, just going the extra mile and just putting yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it depends. If it's an escalation, <laughs> they didn't actually let me interact with like real customers. It was just me and data. But if it's an escalation, like prioritizing what needs to be done right now and what can be done, you know, after we've calmed the situation down, you know, attribution is cool, but is that what we need to know immediately? Maybe we need to deal with some content moderation and then we'll deal with attribution um, depending on whatever the case is. Um, if it's a difficult like team situation, <laughs> listening, um, you know, we had a lot of a lot of situations that involve multiple teams, sometimes with interest and safety, sometimes without. And really listening, like tell me what is your priority? Um, what are your concerns? Um, and really putting yourself in their shoes, whether it's legal or leadership or product and saying, okay, tell me, you know, tell me what your priorities and your concerns are. Um, and then let me explain from our side and using language that people understand, like don't assume knowledge, but don't approach as if, you know, this is their first day on the job either. So kind of figuring out how to speak each other's language. And that's, you know, one thing we focus on in my um, coursework is trying to teach students, like you're going to land on various realms of this digital forensics, you know, giant broad base. Some of you will be legal, some of you will be network security, trust and safety, programmers, whatever. But really we just need a common language so that we can understand each other's priorities and concerns. And so really um, asking questions, but then also making sure that we listen to the answers. People, people like to be listened to, so. Definitely. Um, and then the final question that I have prepared, um, we'll see if Maggie has any that came through the chat, but what would your advice be for someone who is interested in making the transition from healthcare into trust and safety? Or what do you wish trust and safety hire, hiring managers knew about folks with healthcare backgrounds? Tips for success. I would, I would, I will end, I guess, with the, with what I started with, which is ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people um, that you might have seen or, you know, um, you see on a webinar, kind of see what they're up to and 
see what pieces you can take that might be applicable to you. And again, don't be afraid to ask questions. And um, I think sometimes the greatest leaps feel the scariest, but also have the greatest payoff, so to speak. And I would say that certainly has been been the case for me. It was incredibly terrifying, um, but it has been, you know, infinitely more rewarding than I could have ever imagined. And um, so I would say if there's an element of fear or trepidation to, again, lean into it, because that might just mean that there's a piece of you that's looking for something that's different and challenging. I think um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, that's how you learn. I messed up a, a lot in this <laughs> transition and um, I've learned from it made me better. I'm also asking questions. I had one um, young lady reach out to me on LinkedIn. She just saw that I was interested in safety, just asking questions about the field. I'm like, oh my God, I should have did this like years ago. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid, afraid to mess up. This does take time, um, but you got it. And yeah. Um, I think pursuing a lot of on your own learning, even if it's topics that are um, totally foreign to you or you're not sure really impact, just the more you can build your knowledge tool set is huge. Um, there's various uh, blog posts and what have you that have kind of walked through past cases, judgment calls, whether it's reports from platforms, that type of thing. Read those. Really understand how to use the terminology, how to use it correctly. Any hands-on you know, type his experience. There's not a lot of capture the flag type things in trust and safety, but the things that are kind of out there, any hands-on experience so that when you go to interview, you don't sound like you just digested a dictionary, but that you actually have done things with these, ver you know, this verbiage that you really kind of know what you're talking about. Um, and for um, hiring managers, really Focus on the skill set. And when you're building your resume, focus on the skill set. I have a challenge for my students that whatever your past per profession was, you can be a baker, you can be a garbage man, you can be a seamstress. We can take that and we can pull out skills that apply to trust and safety, digital forensics, that type of thing. So really focus on the skills, not the topical knowledge. Topics can be learned with that on your own learning, um, but the skills, the innate curiosity the, you know, logical kind of mindset, how you can tell a story. Storytelling is huge. Um, and that's not innate to everyone. And so it can be built. Um, but if it is innate to you, really capitalize on that. Push that through. And hiring managers, look for that. You can teach this tech stuff. I mean, really, a lot of trust and safety comes down to human behavior. And so, you know, how can you take skills from a past position, especially in healthcare, you're dealing with humans constantly, patients or teams, and, you know, t be willing to ramp up a new hire in topics. That's okay. It doesn't take that long to learn some of this, but um, really focus on the skills and think outside the box. It's okay if you are straight out of high school and you know, whatever your previous jobs were, like take a chance on people. It's it's amazing what cool skills and mindset they will bring to a team. Absolutely. Uh, that That is absolutely what my advice for hiring managers would be is, you know, use that creative problem solving that we have as, as trust and safety professionals to think outside the box and really look at those skills. Uh, some of my best and favorite trust and safety incident ops hires have come from uh, not only healthcare, but uh, hospitality, bartending, these are all human interactions that you are doing a lot of expectation setting and and reading the room. Um, and then I think my piece of advice for transitioning into trust and safety would be um, less for those who are kind of on the precipice and more for those who are newly here of just make the decision. The that That is the hardest thing to do is just like trust that decision that you make and own it and step forward. But um, time and time again, that is the number one place that I have seen folks sort of flame out of the industry is they just get analysis paralysis. Um, they are just continually looking for more information and we don't always have it. So use that judgment that you were hired for and just make the decision and own it. What you just said about <clears throat> bartending is so true. <laughs> 
the uh there's nothing like some retail experience or bartending that's another great one. any kind of customer service really <laughs> so, trust in the safety and, and making decisions on the fly so um thank you everybody for these amazing answers um it's been like a super insightful session and um something that i'm reminded through all your answers is the diversity of all of these fields like Healthcare is not, you know, monolith, neither is trust and safety. And we really need the diversity of skill sets that you bring to the profession to, you know, create a well-rounded uh, and safe platform. So thanks for, for contributing all of your answers. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So um, first one is, good afternoon. I'm enjoying this webinar. I would like to ask one thing to someone who is or wants to start with uh, a career in trust and safety. What would you suggest in terms of certifications, courses, readings? Um, and then this person ended by saying, thank you very much. It inspires me a lot, which is so great to hear. Um, and I think I was actually thinking about this, Jasmine, early on, you mentioned uh, taking like a cybersecurity course. I would love to hear a little bit more about that and how you applied it um, to trust and safety. And then I, if anyone else has any uh, recommended sort of resources, I also have a couple I can mention. Yeah, so um, the cybersecurity course, it was, um, it was a 21 week course, just um, teaching us how to defend platforms, um, if there were any viruses, how to protect your computer or other um, bigger aspects of your of, um, different programs. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, you would have to take that. I just took that because I was looking for something um, different and essentially cybersecurity was not for me, but um, I do think it is a, a a good place to start if you're looking for something outside of um, healthcare, I would definitely uh, recommend it. Any other resources that folks use as they're making this transition or that you've sort of come up with um, along the way? Um, a TSBA, so for anyone who's watching, if you head to the tspa.org site, um, if you're in the middle of thinking through this transition, we have um, a whole course or a whole um, uh, resource that is different topics in trust and safety that you can go through. Um, the Curriculum Working Group has worked really hard to provide that. So it's all from practitioners written by practitioners um, and that helps you kind of familiarize yourself with the how this how we're set up, how people talk about trust and safety. I think that could be a really good resource. There's also um, a trust and safety library on our website that links out to a ton of different like articles and resources um, that are all free and, and public facing. Um, if you have pitch, if you have any of those, you can also contribute some. Um, and then we also have our coffee chats program. And I know folks have found that really useful as they're making this transition. If they see specific like types of companies or roles that they really want to be transitioning to, you're able to set up a one-to-one -one conversation with someone who has direct experience and have a one-to-one -one conversation. I think folks have found that particularly useful as well. Any other things that I'm forgetting? Right. Our second question is, uh, Laura, would you mind telling us more about computer forensics and how uh, she uses these skills in trust and safety teams? Looking for some specific examples. Sure. So computer forensics is, um, think of digital evidence, cyber crime, and cyber abuse. So that involves any um, cyber situations that either stay in the cyber world or cross into the physical world and vice versa. And, you know, think of any physical crime. It absolutely has some sort of piece of digital evidence um, nowadays. <laughs> so it kind of depends on where you land in a trust and safety team. But for me, I was an investigator and an analyst. And so I really had to understand how all these data points work together, um, you know, how browsers work, um, actor groups, that type of thing, um, abusive actions. 
Um, also understanding obviously how the different platforms work, what, what the capabilities are and are not, and then how that can, you know, if you're in content moderation, what does it look like when the real world crosses into the cyber world and vice versa? If people are making threats online, you know, what does that look like for physical crime? We've seen plenty of, you know, physical crime, you know, gangs, cyber bullying, harassment, you know, kind of cross between cross between the two realms. Um, and then digital evidence. We are all leaving a massive digital footprint as we are, you know, on the internet, on our platforms. And so how can, you know, law enforcement or whomever use those digital clues? Um, and so just being aware of that, is there something within the trust and safety realm that we, you know, need to be aware of? How we're how we're handling all of that. So I think it really kind of crosses back and forth between the digital realm and the online realm, and just really understanding um, the data and how all of how all of that works. Thank you, Kim. This next one is for you. Um, you mentioned trusting your own decisions, and as we know, things are not black and white. Um, and that could be really challenging. So I'm curious if there's a couple of examples of a moment where you felt like you really could trust yourself. Like what were those first couple of examples where you're gaining confidence in the field? Oh my gosh. I'm not sure I can think of any um, specific examples. Um, but I, I think sometimes just push comes to shove, especially when you have a marketplace, especially when you have a marketplace that is, users are interacting 24 seven, 365, that you are the last line of defense and there is no one else to like check your work or, you know, get a gut check from or a second opinion. Um, and I think the, probably the first handful of times that I came out of those situations unscathed, um, knowing that I, I made the right decision, um, whether it was for those users or for the business or, or whatnot, uh, definitely started to bolster my confidence. The, the sort of, perspective that I try to take in those situations where I just wish I knew one more piece of evidence is uh, remembering values, whether it's sort of like the North Star for the team, the North Star, um, you know, for the company, certainly for Thumbtack, it's making sure that we are being human first and we are taking care of our team and that we're taking care of our, co our customers and our pros. Um, and I trust my leadership enough that if I make a decision with that in mind, with sound logic, like we will come out of it on the other side. Okay. Um, I think that, yeah, just being able to like, keep, keep that, that mission in mind is, is really important. Um, and I, I tend to just ask myself as well, like what, what is the risk if I get this, this, uh, decision wrong? That's, yeah. uh, yeah. More often than not, it's, it's not as big of a deal as, as sometimes you make it in, into in your head. So, you know, what is, what's the, what's the risk if I get this decision wrong? Um, and, you know, do, do your best from there. Just do, do what you can with the information you have. I love it. And we have one time for one more question. Um, and the question is around someone who is trying to move from a content moderator position into more of an, a forensic analyst or an analyst position. And if anyone on this call who's made sort of a similar transition um, has sort of advice for making that transition, like what to keep in mind. Um, there was somebody on our team who did this um, and he turned out to be a phenomenal analyst. Um, he did his content moderation job exceptionally well, but then also learned to kind of pull on different threads and sort of did um, some clustering of activity and sort of kicked off his own sort of investigation. So when the leads were passed, they were much fuller leads um, and that was noticed um, by us. And so then when we had a role open, it was like, hey, like you've sent some really fruitful leads that had more background than other leads because you have taken it upon yourself still within, you know, the realm of what your job is. Um, but you've kind of taken, taken the step to kind of pull on some of these strings 
and send us a narrative instead of just leads. Um, and so I think using, building that innate curiosity within your role, however you're allowed to, um, following those leads and seeing if you can create a, a more complete picture and that, you know, that will be noticed um, and looking for any mentoring. Most people that I've met in tech are more than happy to share some time, to do some job shadowing in terms of whatever is allowed. And so reaching out proactively for those opportunities um, and just kind of making making your name known on the team that you want to want to switch over to. Awesome. I know we're right at time, so I think we're going to wrap it. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, this has been incredibly insightful and useful. And um, thanks for all of our participants for joining. Um, and thanks for everybody watching this later. All right. See you guys soon. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>